I think we are there. I awesome. think we're broadcasting. I think we're live. Um, Great. Good morning, Jim. How are you? It's Bernard in Birmingham. Great, Bernard. It's good to be with you. You too. And we're in, on Nomberg Law Live, I think. Let me just make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing here. We are live. And good morning Great. to everybody. Uh, I've got my good friend, new good friend, Jim Hacking from St. Louis, Missouri. He is a passionate lawyer and loves what he does. And that's one of the things that I have always uh, found that anybody who's successful in anything that they do is they bring passion to the game. And Jim, from the little few months that I've known you, I know that's that's where you come from. And I appreciate you being on Nomberg Law Live this morning. Thanks, Bernard. I'm a big fan of your show. I've watched a couple episodes. I think you do great stuff, so I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're going to talk this morning about what Jim does for a living, and that is immigration law and his practice. And Jim has, uh, he's setting the bar very high for immigration lawyers and, and what he does. And, and I have had the privilege of, of seeing many of the things that you do over the last almost six months. And I'm very, uh, I'm very impressed with your practice, with your passion, with what you do and, uh, and how you do it. So I just wanted to commend you on that on the front end. Thanks so much. Well, let's uh, let's jump right in, Jim, and, and why don't you introduce a little bit more about yourself and, and tell us about your practice and a little bit of your background. We'll save the uh, St. Louis Cardinals New York Jets for the end of the, the conversation. <laughs> Okie doke. So I grew up in St. Louis. I work at an immigration law firm that I started 10 years ago. I've been an attorney for 20 years. My wife is originally from Egypt. She moved to the United States when she was seven. She grew up in Chicago, and we met on the first day of law school. I actually held the door open for her uh, on the first day of law school. And um, for the first 10 years of my practice, I was a maritime lawyer. So I was representing barging and shipping companies in federal court, uh, usually litigating either Jones Act claims or uh, dent bar dented barges or barges that hit bridges and things like that. And I always had uh, friends from my wife's community asking me to help them with immigration matters, and a lot of our friends needed immigration work, and I kept turning them down, and I kept saying, you know, I only do barge work, and they would scratch their head and say, what in the world is a barge? And uh, eventually, I would try to refer out these cases, and um, immigration attorneys would tell me how busy they were. And I was at a law firm with two other attorneys. Uh, one was 20 years older than me, one was 10 years older than me, and I learned a ton. I became a partner. I loved them very much. They were very good to me. They gave me great training, but we only had four clients, and I was always worried that if one of them retired suddenly or if something happened or if we lost a client, that here I would be without any clients of my own. I had worked at a, at a previous law firm for a short time for an attorney who had no clients of his own, and he worked, the owner of the firm was a real jerk, and he would cuss the guy out in public and humiliate him, and the guy had to take it because he had no clients of his own. So um, I had two or three kids at the time. My wife was working at St. Louis University Law School, so we had health insurance. So even though I'd become a partner at this firm, I made the decision to go out on my own and to start doing work for immigrants. But that was a scary proposition to start with, but I bet you're glad that you did it now that you've been through all that. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to get your arms around a barge and hug it when you fix its dented damage. Um, it's a lot more fun and a lot more fulfilling. I mean, right now we have probably, I mean, we probably help around 250 people a year for the last 10 years on average. And so, you know, we have a lot. One of my favorite things to do, Bernard, I'll show you sometime, is in our off, in our conference room, we take pictures of everybody at their naturalization interview or their green card interview or their oath ceremony or whenever we help them with something. So we're, our bread and butter is bringing couples together. So like 50% of our practice, right now all we do is immigration. When I first started out, we thought we would do immigration work and legal work for immigrants, like car accidents for immigrants and things like But quickly the focus became immigration. It just became obvious that's where the real need was. And so most of what we do even inside immigration is Bernard just married someone back home in the home country and he wants to bring them here to the United States or um, that person is already in the United States and they want to stay. So that's like 60% of what we do. We also do citizenship. We help companies with employer, uh, employers who want to sponsor a foreign national to work for them. 
We help people who uh, fear going back home to their home country. They seek asylum in the United States. And then we help with deportation defense. So people who are in the United States either without status or have violated the terms of their status or have committed some kind of crime and they get into a scenario where we're trying to keep them from getting deported. That's sort of most of what we do. It sounds like you give great comfort to those who are in need of it the most at the time they're trying to make life decisions. Quite admirable. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we don't do criminal work, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, criminal work is very stressful. The deportation stuff is almost as stressful because really with immigration and everything, it's a zero-sum game. You don't get to go to mediation with the government and cut a deal right before trial. We, we either win or we lose, and that's true in deportation. That's also true when we ask for an immigration benefit for our clients dealing with USCIS. Certainly, certainly. Well, I want to pause for a second and give a shout out to two of our friends, uh, Mitch in California and Mo up in Huntsville. They they are watching with us and they've shared out this broadcast. Good morning, fellas, and thank you for for joining us for a bit. We, oh, we're glad that you're there with us. That reminds me, I should share it out myself. I'll do that right now while we're talking. Okay. And as always, uh, guys, because we're doing this through Facebook Live, there's a comment section. Uh, that's accompanying our, our uh, interview here, and you're welcome to send in your questions either now or, or later on. And of course, I'll share uh, all of Jim's uh, contact information should you want to reach out to him with your questions or concerns about uh, immigration law and immigration practice. And uh, Jim, I know you're a very busy man. You've got all the, the podcasts, which I listen to regularly uh, on Maximum Lawyer. You and Tyson do a fantastic job, and I appreciate all that you guys do each week. Um, I know that takes up a lot of your time, so just having time to do this this morning it means a lot to me. So thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. Let's let's get into. I know that the, the last couple of years, what you do in this topic is such a hot hot issue with the current administration. The law seem to change. For those of us like me who don't practice this type of law, it's in the uh, news almost every day, if not multiple times a day. Um, and it just seems to be a, a shifting sands for those of us who are not in, informed. And, and I guess, Jim, one of my first questions about this specifically would be, is what are some of the, the misconceptions that people have about immigration? I think the biggest misconception of all has to deal with the people who are here undocumented. At our office, we don't really use the term illegal alien, but a lot of people do. So in talking about those people, the, the people who are here without actual status. Either they've snuck into the United States and therefore were uninspected and have no um, real legal claim to be here, or people who came on a visit visa or some other kind of visa and overstayed, never went home. The, the myth, the biggest myth about those people is that there is a line that they can get into, there's a fine that they can pay, there's a procedure that they can undergo to get into status. And um, I heard a great example of this last week on a uh, NPR report. NPR did a great story last week. I'll put it in the, um, the broadcast on Facebook about a guy named Manuel who's been out of the United States. They basically, what they did is they followed a run of the mill, pretty straightforward deportation case for someone from Mexico. Um, they anonymized his name, but they sort of, they told the story over the course of the nine months that he was in detention and facing deportation and sort of what happened. I found it to be very compelling, but they talked to some regular people who lived around the immigration detention center, some Americans, and the people all to a, a, every one of them basically said, I don't, don't understand why these people don't just get in line. I know this guy from Japan who came over and he got status and I don't know why they didn't. And the fact is that as the law stands now, and as it stood for many years, there is no line. There's no procedure. There's nothing they can do to get into status. Now, some people would say very quickly, well, then they should just go back home. And that might be true. Um, but at the end of the day, the biggest myth, I think, that really hurts our ability to have a meaningful discussion about what to do with the 11 or 12 million undocumented people is that there is no procedure right now for them to get into status. What um, then? I mean, some what other myths. Yeah, go go ahead, Jim. Some other. I mean, a lot of people think that immigrants are a drain on society, but if you look at at the Fortune 500 companies, I think almost half of them were started by immigrants or the children of immigrants. The fact mm -hmm. is, immigrants pay taxes in the form of state taxes. Many pay federal income tax, which surprises a lot of people. 
Um, the idea, another myth would be anchor babies, the idea that if you can just somehow get into the United States, have a baby, that that's going to save your bacon and keep you here. That's just flatly untrue. The United States deports people every day and twice on Sunday who have a U.S. citizen child. So, so that's an, another big myth. It's my practice predominantly is Social Security disability and work comp and, and personal injury cases. And I can't tell you how many times my brother and I have sat across the table from folks who are just scared to pursue a claim because they're afraid either their, uh, their uh, employer is going to turn them in because they've been threatened. If you make a work comp claim, uh, we're going to take measures to, to have you deported or whatever. Um, and it just breaks my heart because they have, uh, in many instances, our laws, particularly work comp laws, they protect uh, folks who are undocumented just like they do somebody who was born in the state of Alabama. But there's a, a, a trust issue that is just the, the hurdle that we have found in many instances that they would rather forego making a claim and giving up their legal rights to medical care, uh, to payments for compensation and the like because they're just afraid that they're going to be found out and they're going to be gone. And it just, there's nothing I can do about it. We can just advise their clients. And I suspect you've had that history or that experiences from time to time as well. It took me a long time to come to grips with my feelings about um, what it is to live life in the shadows. And I think most people don't really understand. I, I had a client once who was undocumented. We were applying for DACA for him, which is the pro program that President Obama had that allowed some young people to get into temporary status, he, his car got hit out in front of our mm -hmm. office by actually a neighboring business owner. And we couldn't call the police because he was worried that he would rather pay for the damage himself than to make a claim. Yeah. Um, we have people come to see us at least, at least once a month, usually two or three times a month, we'll have someone come to us where they have an undocumented spouse. It, uh, it's usually the husband. The husband came into the United States and the U.S. citizen um, would like to be able to sponsor them, um, but because they were never inspected by the government, there's no real avenue of relief, and we can't tell them to raise their hand and say that they're here. So, yeah, we see that a lot. We have those conversations like you have, and they are, as you say, very heartbreaking. It just, uh, there's just, all you can do is provide the information to them and then assure them up to the extent that you can assure them, and then they have to make that decision, but you can't force somebody to do something that they're not comfortable in doing. That's absolutely right. Sure. Yeah, and I get I get called in from time to time from plaintiff's attorneys wondering what they should do with an undocumented client and whether they should mm -hmm. pursue it. And obviously it's the client's end call, but I think there are some, some safeguards there. I mean, I think that the idea that an employer is going to call the government and tell them that they, the, the employer, have been illegally employing someone, that's sort of a, a stretch. But really the thing about being living in the shadows is you can you can get in a – car accident, you can be walking down the street, um, you know, in a lot of southern states near the border, they have um, citizenship checkpoints, like they have sobriety checkpoints, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people have to be really careful and selective with what they do. Absolutely. Uh, with with the, the new administration, um, there's come lots of new laws, lots of new either fears or comforts, depending on what side of the, the equation that you, you look at. Talk to us a little bit about the changes in the laws under the Trump administration. So the, the, the fun fact is that as things stand right now, the laws haven't changed. You know, the, the, the fundamental underpinnings of where we get our immigration laws are from case law, from statute and from regulations. And as of now, other than ending DACA, which obviously was a big thing for a lot of people, um, there haven't been any legal changes. Like Congress hasn't changed the Immigration and Nationality Act since Trump took office. Um, but of course, as the executive branch, they're in charge of enforcement. And so enforcement of the laws, that's what's really changed. So of course, the biggest change is the ending of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This was a temporary Band-Aid fix that President Obama did to try to allow young people who are here in the United States to do two things. One, to get work authorization and to have their deportations halted. And President uh, Trump has given Congress until March 5th to fix that, to fix that problem. He and Attorney, Jeff, Attorney General Jeff Sessions have said that they believe the DACA program to be 
contrary to the immigration laws, and so they they have called on Congress to take action. We'll see if anything happens. Um, but on the enforcement side, um, even though President Obama deported individuals at a very high rate, and you can debate whether or not he was the deporter-in-chief. A lot of people used to call him the deporter-in-chief, but a lot of those statistics of him being a high deporter come from the fact that when they turned people around at the border, they, consid they considered that a deportation. So either way, he was deporting people at a very high rate, higher uh, than President Bush, for sure, and higher than any other president before him. Um, but despite that, the officers in Immigration and Customs Enforcement felt that he was restraining their ability to do their job and that their, their job is to you know, strictly enforce the immigration laws. And so with President Trump, I, I believe the way I sort of phrase it is that ICE officials feel unchained, like they have been untethered and they can do what they want. And so in the old days, like if they came upon a group of people and four or five of them um, were together and they were looking for one particular person, they would just find out who that person was and they'd take them and go. Now they'll check the immigration status of everybody in a house. They'll, they're, they're pushing much more uh, cases to immigration court. So the number of deportations under President Trump are actually down a little bit, but I think that's mostly because the courts are so backlogged. I mean, Bernard, do you have any idea, like if I had a new case, a deportation case, and someone um, was not being detained, do you know when their court date would be? No, no idea. Probably 2020, maybe 2021. We're getting court dates wow. 2021, 2020. So the I, so I mean, I understand that there's a lot of money to be made in the deportation business. You know, a lot of these people are housed in these detention centers that are funded by these private um, jail corporations, and there's a ton of money to be made. And where the money is not being spent is the immigration court. So if you really want to um, talk about letting people stay in the United States without authorization, I think, um, and again, obviously I, my job is to keep people here, but the, the courts are adequate, are inadequately funded. They're, they're woefully overworked. These judges have these dockets, Bernard, um, you know, 40 cases in the morning, 40 cases in the afternoon when they're just doing their motion dockets. And then when they have hearings, you know, you get these hearing dates three or four years out. It's, it's, as I say often about immigration and specifically about the immigration court is it's no way to run a country. Yeah. It sounds like they're even more backed up than the Social Security Administration trying to get <laughs> right. to disability cases. Pro probably be a good race to see. Yeah, yeah, uh, un unfortunately. Uh, Jim, share with us a little bit about some resources that immigrants can, can use to find out how to get here, how to stay, and, and information they might need uh, that would help give them at least a little bit less stress so they'd be knowledgeable about their situation. I mean, one thing, Bernard, that we've been seeing a lot lately, and I think it comes out a lot when enforcement is at a high point, is that there are a lot of fake lawyers out there, a lot of people giving out immigration advice. I had a very interesting situation a couple weeks ago. I didn't know what to do. So I had a mother and a father who were in their 70s and a daughter and son-in-law in my office. They were all from Vietnam, and they had this translator there, and he had been basically handling their case in a pretty complicated way a pretty complicated case. He had been handling it for the last nine months, and he completely screwed it up. The daughter's the daughter was going to have to leave, and I was the only person. Or he was the only person in the room besides me who spoke English. So I lost my cool too quickly, and I started yelling at him. And I couldn't convey to the clients, the potential clients, that this guy was a notario and he was taking advantage of them. So I think there's a lot of bad resources out there, and I think there's a lot of people sort of preying, preying on immigrants. Um, luckily, this mother and father and the daughter came back to see me with an actual translator who wasn't the one that screwed up their case. So we were able to work on it right now to try to help them. But um, as far as resources, I think that the most important thing in most cases is that people use an attorney who's a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. There are a lot of attorneys who dabble in immigration and just as I would never dabble in Social Security or workers' comp, I think uh, dabbling in immigration, especially uh, these days, is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that I would look for that AILA, American Immigration Lawyers Association, seal of approval. I think that there are also a lot of good clinics for people that don't have money. Um, 
but those people usually have really good training because they, they have to deal with this sort of high volume practice as well. So I would look for um, attorneys who know what they're doing, who have experience. Um, we have a lot of resources on our website. Um, we have re special reports on spouse visas and things um, and uh, how, to, how to get a work visa, those kinds of things. And, and I think that that's always a good resource. We, we have about 250 YouTube videos and about 900 pages of content on our website. So we really try that's to fantastic. educate people. Yeah, we really try to educate people because we want people making a good decision. Absolutely, and we'll, uh, good morning, Nick. We've got uh, another one of our online buddies, uh, awesome fellow out in California. Glad you're watching in as, as well. Uh, and we'll put in the, the comment section links to not only your uh, YouTube, your, your website, as, as well as any other resources you think may be uh, of help. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, Jim, let's uh, let's talk for just a minute. I want you to, not, not a lot of attorneys do what you do. There's lots of personal injury lawyers. There's lots of folks who do divorce, et cetera. But my experience, uh, at least in the Birmingham metro area, there's only a few lawyers who really concentrate in immigration law, and they do a very fine job, but they're a very small group. And I don't seem to hear their stories. I don't seem to get much feedback or, or hear from them about successes or failures or, or what makes them tick, what makes them come to work every day and be as passionate as I've seen that you are. And I'd like you to, if you don't mind, share with us, just give us some insight on something that just makes you glad that you do the type of work that you do. Okay, so that's a great question, Bernard, and I'm glad you asked it. I think in a lot of ways that um, most immigration attorneys are extremely busy and they're doing work that's very important and they don't take the time to stop and talk about their successes and to talk about their struggles and I think one of the reasons that people resonate with our message is because we do tell our clients stories. So I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, right after law school, I changed my religion. I became a Muslim. And so most of my clients are from the Middle East and from Muslim countries. And my greatest success, and I believe my purpose in life is to, to sue the federal government. So I have these Muslim people who have had their cases delayed longer than average, longer than other people. And um, so I sort of, with my litigation background in federal court, I started suing the government um, for these immigration delays. There's a program called the Controlled Application Review and Resolution Program, which is basically a program designed to slow down immigration from Muslim countries and to sort of do extreme vetting. This is even before President Trump. It's been on the books and the ACLU found out about it. Since that time, I've sued the government, I think right now about 110 times for people who have been waiting. So I'll have a client who's been waiting, like say they've been waiting for their citizenship. This I've seen this probably 10 times for Pakistani doctors. So these doctors who came to the United States, finished medical school. I, I have a friend, a client who is the head of, of transplants. He, he has to certify every transplant in the state of Oklahoma. So he's wow. saving lives every day. And they delayed his citizenship case for four years. Wow. So I, I filed a lawsuit in federal court, and within 60 days he had an interview, and a month later he was a U.S. citizen. So that really is my favorite thing to do, to, to bring comfort to people who've been waiting for so long to get their immigration benefit. I can sort of come in, do my thing, I've systematized it, and I sue them, I serve them, and usually what happens is the Immigration Service doesn't want to fight over whether or not that CARP program is legal or not. They just go ahead and work on the person's case and and adjudicate it. Well, that's, that's a, that is a great story, and I know that makes you feel very uh, glad for the work that you do and that your office and staff uh, assist that you do. Um, Jim, you're based in St. Louis, but I know your practice is not limited to St. Louis. Tell us a little bit more about your, your practice and where you do your work and things like that. Yeah, so the cool thing about immigration law is that it's federal, so it's all based on federal law. So um, there's some cases where it doesn't make a lot of economic sense for me to handle people's cases, but we do handle cases all over the country, especially these lawsuits. I've been doing interviews, uh, immigration interviews all over the country. Um, so, and there's a lot of stuff that we do that involves the American citizen in the United States and the foreign national overseas. We can handle those cases all day long from here in St. Louis. So. Um, I think we're getting ready to sort of branch out to some other areas, um, sort of on a hard, harder approach. 
but um, for right now, yeah, we can handle cases all over. I have I have two cases uh, pending right now in Alabama. We've probably handled four or five. We do a lot in Memphis, Memphis, mm -hmm. Kansas City, Chicago. Yeah. So are you, it sounds like you're on a barbecue circuit. <laughs> yeah, but that's I don't right. Know if you eat yeah. barbecue or not, but I love uh, barbecue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We have uh, we have uh, St. Louis has gotten pretty good on the barbecue scene. Um, there's a, a couple places. There's like a, it's funny. There was one place that was really big, and they have all these little offshoots now of barbecue mm -hmm. places. I guess the guys get in a fight and start their own restaurant. But um, yeah, St. Louis has a good barbecue scene. Kansas City's great. That's where the immigration court is that we go to the most, and then Memphis for sure. Well, I know you're you're putting together the the seminar sometime in 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 May, and I hope that uh, I'll be able to come up and attend it, and maybe that'd be uh, great. It, as much as it's going to hurt me to go see a Cardinals baseball game, I'll muster through it. I'm a Braves. So who fan do you who do you root for, Braves? Yeah, a Braves fan through and through. Uh, well, I know, <laughs> and we'll, let's step back away from from the immigration laws and and these things for just a minute as we close. Um, I know you to be a, and this is a curiosity for me. A New York Jets football fan and a St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. Um, you care well, to elaborate for a minute? <laughs> yeah, so the Cardinals are my team that wins and the Jets are my team that lose. Uh, the Cardinals, obviously, my dad and I, we went to the World Series when I was 12 in 1982. I saw game two of the World Series. My my former hero, Ted Simmons, had a home run against us, but we won the game, and then we ultimately won that World Series. Um, I love baseball. I coached baseball for my boys for a long time. I'm helping my daughter now with softball. I, I, I love uh, the intricacies of the game. Um, I, I've probably been to 17 or 18 stadiums, so I love going to outside the games outside of St. Louis. As far as the Jets, um, you know, the, the, we had a football team here, the Cardinals, when I grew up, and then they moved. And, but my aunt had, emailed, or had mailed me a jersey from the Jets. She lived in New York. Back when I was a kid, and that was my favorite jersey. A guy named Wesley Walker. He was oh, blind sure. in one eye. He was blind in one eye, and um, I just thought he was the best. So um, the Jets have always been my team. That has spread to one of my sons. He's a huge Jets fan, and you know our hero Gary Vaynerchuk. He's working towards making 1.2 billion so he can win the buy the Jets. And I don't think they're going to win until then because right now they just have some horrible horrible management. So well, it's it's rough. We it's rough. Well, rooting for the Jets kind of seems to go hand in hand with your your practice of, of rooting for the underdog, uh, always rooting for the underdog. Yeah. Well, uh, they're the underdog for sure. That's right. And that that 82, I'm still a little bitter about the 82 playoffs. You took care of my Braves uh, back then. Um, so that was but, great. I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you remember. That was a five game series, and back mm -hmm. then it was only it was only the East and the West, and the Cardinals mm -hmm. and the Braves. Uh, Phil Necro pitched game one. And the Braves were up like 10 to 1 in the fourth inning, and it got rained out. And that knocked off their whole rotation. Cardinals, yep, yep, I remember that for sure. Yep. Now I'm regretting that we were even talking about this part of the uh... – <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I do want to give a shout-out to one of my buddies, Brett, who's watching us here in town, and Big Mike in Texas. Welcome, guys. We appreciate you stopping by for a few minutes and, and chatting with us. And we're we're almost done here. And, and, and Jim, I sure appreciate all of the, the insight that you've given us. It's very powerful information that hopefully folks after today can, can take and, and hopefully find you, uh, find your office, and, and get those answers. A lot of it uh, I know that you, you publish uh, online uh, that folks can go find some preliminary answers, but I don't think there's anything – that replaces actually talking to an experienced lawyer in whatever field that it may be. So I would encourage anybody who's here to get in touch with, with Jim's office uh, to, to find out those answers that they're looking for. Uh, Jim, before we before we wrap up, uh, if you would give us your, your uh, phone number, all your contact information that we'll also, again, put in the comments section. Sure. So our website is uh, hackinglawpractice.com. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Jim Hacking, Twitter's at Jim Hacking. Um, we, uh, our phone number is 314-961-8200. Um, we have all those YouTube videos, so check that out for sure. My intern has gone through and made those into channels so that each, or a playlist so that each um, practice area is covered within immigration. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out or email me, uh, Jim at HackingLawPractice.com. Happy to answer any questions. We do have another newer podcast. We're about 30 episodes in. It's called The Immigration Answers Show. So uh, if people go to that, to ImmigrationAnswersShow.com, 
they can actually record a question and we can turn we turn it into a podcast episode with me answering the question. So that's been fun. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Again, Jim, thank you for your time this morning and being on Nomberg Law Live with me. Uh, I, I'm sure you and I'll uh, see each other again maybe tonight. Uh, yeah. Mitch's group, if you've got the time, I think I've, I've got it on my calendar. Guys, thank you again for, for stopping by either now or, or checking us out later on. Uh, of course, we'll put it on our website, uh, nomberglaw.com. We'll also put it on our, our YouTube channel, the usual places. Uh, next week, we've got a real treat as, as well as, as each week, for me at least it is, uh, we've got a, a local chef uh, who's going to uh, share with us about his um, uh, galley and garden restaurant here in town. And uh, as always, it's Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Central. Uh, I'm Bernard Nomberg with Jim Hacking. Uh, Nomberg Law Live is uh, each week that we appreciate anybody and everybody who stops by. Um, and we hope you guys have a good rest of your week and uh, take care. Bye-bye.